Did you know that Ohio ranks among the top 10 states in the nation when it comes to foreclosures? This is a very serious situation in America when you consider that one out of every 452 homes in Ohio has received a foreclosure notice. But help is only a phone call away. Hello, I'm Kathy Lair, and during this special live program on housing foreclosures, we've opened our phone lines to hopefully help you avoid being foreclosed upon. Joining us in the studio tonight, we have local home ownership and foreclosure specialists who are ready to take your call and give you expert advice on how to possibly avoid foreclosure. The number and the website are on your screen. As an indicator of how successful these foreclosure phonathons have been in the past, we have logged thousands of calls so far. During this evening's program, we will also hear some great advice on what to expect and what to avoid when dealing with lenders, lawyers, foreclosure specialists, and even con artists. Our guests tonight are Rick Williams, the President and CEO of the Home Ownership Center of Greater Cincinnati. The Home Ownership Center is a nonprofit partnership of residents, businesses, and government that is dedicated to strengthening communities through comprehensive home ownership strategies. Stephanie Casey Pierce, the Outreach Coordinator for the Ohio Department of Commerce. She oversees the Save the Dream project. And Dr. LaVon Henry, Vice President and Senior Regional Officer from the Cincinnati branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Before we get started, though, I want to mention that this program is being simulcast on 91.7 WVXU, and reporter Ann Thompson will be joining us this evening as the program continues. Let's first talk about when it comes to foreclosures, what are we seeing locally, Rick? Well, we are, it looks like it may be a, at a plateau level for Hamilton County. Uh, I don't know if too many people know that, but the city of Cincinnati does not foreclose. It's a county function. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like Hamilton County, while it was growing for a while, seems to be at plateau. The problem with that is it's still a high number. And so that means that there are still families in trouble and that still means we need the services. Now we've been working on these foreclosure programs for a while. Yes, we have. What has changed from the first one we did? Let's go back maybe, what, a year, year and a half ago? About a year and a half, right. How, how has how we deal with the problem changed? Well, uh, the reason uh, we needed to come up with this idea was that we were, like uh, all parts of the country, providing workshops. And these workshops were organized in a way that there was a large venue and lenders would come to town and you would have the opportunity to go talk to that lender. Well, very few families would take advantage of that, you know, through embarrassment or fear or misunderstanding, they would freeze and not do what was necessary to save their home. So we came up with an idea where they can, with the privacy of a phone, start that services and start to help themselves. And uh, so we started last February and uh, we started with, I think, 10 phones. And here we are today with about 55 phones that are providing that service. And we have another set of phones that are taking, uh, making appointments to meet the lenders who are coming to town this time. I was going to say, what happens when somebody calls the hotline and connects with one of our operators? Well, what will happen is we begin immediately with the process of assistance. And what that means is we're taking data. And we use that data to set a uh, situation or a snapshot of your situation for that lender because that's going to be critical when you have that engagement. Uh, it's important to remember that the mortgage that you have is with that loan servicer or that lender. And they have the ability to make changes to change your situation, but we have to make a case for that. And that begins right with that phone call. When it comes to foreclosure, how many payments do you traditionally need to miss before you end up there? It's really interesting to ask that because uh, it depends on the lender. That's why this whole thing is rather confusing because each loan servicer treats this situation differently and uh, so it's hard for me to say that at this particular point you can expect the next thing. In fact, I had a conversation with a homeowner today who actually did call the phone-a-thon who was only one payment short. So he's only delinquent for one month, but yet he received a letter warning him about a foreclosure process. Now, I don't want to make that sound like that lender is about to foreclose on him. It really is a statement of start to get the help early mm -hmm. before you get to the point where foreclosure is imminent. And that is an important message. That's, when, is, when should you pick up the phone and ask for help? Say you get you know, the notice and or you're behind one payment. What do you do? 
the great thing about this photo thing is we're starting to receive phone calls so early in the process and it is so much easier to help a homeowner when that call becomes early in that process and homeowners are starting to understand that if they understand that their job is going to be lost uh, they even have a severance they call and that's the best time to do that so the earlier that you understand that there's going to be a potential difficulty in making that mortgage payment, medical reasons, all of those reasons that can happen, make the call. What are you hearing from the people that you talk to in terms of why they don't pick up that call and why they wait so late in the process, some of them, to get involved, to finally reach out for help? Uh, fear, embarrassment, uh, confusion, uh, because uh, Today, the loan servicer who has your mortgage is multi-department. So there's multiple departments that will be contacting you and you can get conflicting information from the same loan servicer who has your loan. That's a very confusing situation when you have loss mitigation after you to make the payment, but then you have another department, which most of them have now, which is, whose job it is to help you avoid the foreclosure within the same organization. And you're hearing from both of them at the same time, and it's rather confusing uh, to know what's really happening. And so it's important to be able to get assistance to understand that that's what's happening. You should always work toward avoiding that foreclosure and understand that even as that department has to move forward with that process, the other department also has to move forward in helping you to avoid it. And, but you still feel that so all alone when that happens to absolutely, you, Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the great things about working with the counseling organization is you start to understand that you're not alone. And you start to understand that when you see things like the photothon and hear those phones ringing all over, they all represent a homeowner who's at risk. Now this phone-a-thon has been, will totally be going over three days. Over three days, which is another change from when we first working together a year and a half yes. ago. And we did it for one day, the last two times. But I will say that uh, we have the phones rolling over to Fannie Mae, who's a great partner in this. Mm -hmm. And they would continue to take calls for three days anyway. And so we're now just marketing those three days, mostly because we have the lenders coming to town and we have to make appointments. And so we we want to be able to have a period where we can understand what their appointments are. Is it possible to put a face on the person who is going through foreclosure? Not anymore. Uh, look in the mirror and it's your face. It could happen to any of us and it happens to all demographics, it happens to all geographies, and there's no presentation any longer that basically is the typical homeowner who's under at risk. So uh, it's important for everyone to know that it could happen to anyone. One catastrophic incident and suddenly you're faced with the risk. Is it any different here than it is in other parts of the United States? No, and I would speak to the fact that for the last three, four years I've been speaking on this topic about foreclosures in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's different in terms of, let's say, primary cause, but how it's working through the system is pretty much no different. And what I speak to there is this. Three years, four years ago, foreclosures are rising. Why? Subprime. Bad lending practices bad borrowing practices, okay, mismanagement of debt. But now what we have now is the market has evolved, the problem has evolved, and actually the problem, albeit Cincinnati is at a plateau, the problem has evolved to be larger. And that larger element, unemployment. We're pushing against an unemployment rate that we have not seen in this nation for almost 26 years. We're currently at 9.8 percent. Ohio's at 10.8 percent. And some may say, well, that's down from 11.2 that we saw the previous month. That's only because, you know why? People left the workforce. So the fact of the matter is this. Are we different than the nation? Yes, in ways. In one way, we're not. No, one way we are is that the problem is more intense in Ohio than many parts of the nation. We're in the top ten for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the broad market reason, rising unemployment in some of our fundamental sectors. 
we're going to be talking a little bit about the Save the Dream organization and how it can help homeowners. Do you think a lot of people are, are getting the, the word that they can reach out, that there is help available? Are you sensing that? I hope so. Um, we are doing our best to get the word out about all the resources that are available in the community. I think that this phone-a-thon is a great way to get the message out to folks that there are housing counselors that are out there who can talk to you about your situation. Rick, what are some things people need to do before they, before they make that first call? Are there some papers, some things they need to have in front of them that those people on the other end are going to be asking them for? Yes, there are. There's, there's a whole list of those that uh, will be covered later. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, most importantly, the last statement that you receive from your loan servicer or lender, that's really critical for those initial phone conversations to understand the type of loan that you have, who your lender is, uh, the loan number. Those are the beginnings of the uh, information that you need and then the other is personal information why you're in this situation that sort of thing and, and it's got to be rewarding for you I know we've talked about this before some people who think you know I've lost this house and they found a way to keep that house absolutely there are those stories absolutely that the foreclosure date the sale date is already there uh, we've we have someone who has called the phone -a yesterday who had moved out of his home he thought that it was already over and we encouraged him to move back into that home because it is not over. It's not over until it's sold. And he's on the path to saving that home. That's great news. Joining me this evening is WVXU reporter Ann Thompson. Right now she is joined by Christopher and Dorothy Gilliam, who are local homeowners that recently received foreclosure prevention counseling after falling victim to a foreclosure scam. Ann? Thanks for being here. I know you faced a very difficult situation. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, in 2007, um, I, I called our mortgage in, and we were informed, or I was informed uh, on the phone, that my wife was deceased, and they were no longer going to accept our mortgage payments. And I was very baffled by this. Uh, like, what do you mean my wife is deceased? She's at work. And they refused to believe that my wife was still alive, and they refused to take our mortgage payments. And they proceeded foreclosure against us to, to take our house. So I called my wife frantically, and I said, honey, I said, they won't take our mortgage payments. They believe that you are deceased. And she's like, what? So she calls them, and she works for a school. She had the school principal call, and they refused to believe that my wife was still alive. And so uh, we was just at a loss. And so we, we hired a foreclosure agency to help us to detangle this mess. And um, the floor closure agency did us more harm than help. And um, You got cut off in one of these foreclosure scams. Yes. Uh, they came to our house, promised that they could get it worked out. We gave them uh, 900-something dollars uh, up front of our money. And they kind of like just dropped the ball on us and we looked up and our house was up for sheriff's sale in a week. And they were telling us that they were working it out with our loan server. But uh, in fact, our house was already up for sheriff's sale. So we called the attorney general's office, frantic. Attorney general's office really uh, looked into the matter uh, while we were on the phone and told us, uh, like, hold on, we're going to get you some help. They contacted the Legal Aid Society, and uh, the Legal Aid Society picked up the ball and started trying to make sense of all of this. And with the help of Mr. Noel Morgan and, and, and Mark Lawson and at the Legal Aid Society, uh, we are still in our home, but we're still trying to get this whole mess you know, straightened out, and it's just been one big nightmare. And as you can see, my wife is right here, uh, very much alive. And, it's and just, so, what were you thinking during this whole thing? Um, needless to say, that it's it's a, it's a it's an emotional distress that anybody would go through because it it not only affected the home situation, it also affected our taxes. And um, so, it was it was reported to the IRS that I was deceased, the Lexus Nexus. So it took a lot of untangling to actually fig figure out all of this and get everything cleared up just enough to say, okay, I'm not deceased. Bef I mean, that in itself took about a year just to say, okay, I'm not deceased. And this whole thing seems unbelievable. Oh, of course it does. Yes. <laughs> so um, tell me a little bit about how long this has gone on. This has been years? Uh, well, we've been actually um, clients of legal aid now for about a year. We we fought this uh, for about two years. For about two years, it's been since 2007, around October, November, when this snowball 
for, first started, and yeah. um, so it's and League Way is still um, fighting and getting things worked out to try to get us back into our mortgage. We're not back in our mortgage yet, um, but League Way is handling that, and it seems like things are getting wrapped up now. But it's been a two-year fight, uh, and yeah. it's been very. Uh, my wife is. She uh, she got really sick after that, you know. Yeah. She really became very, very stressful, very yeah, stressed very stressful. out. She's been in the hospital about 20 times in the last two years and had major operations. She was stressed her out so bad, and so it's just it was it was very um, uh, disheartening at first. Uh, and you know, and if it had not been for really my wife and my kids and this home to my wife and my kids and to myself is like a beacon of light we're like one of the first homeowners in our families and um you know and how did you find help through all of this uh, well as far as who helped us in this well I, we, we called the attorney general office and the attorney general office could not believe it like much people it's just right. they just could not believe this and they contacted the legal aid society gave us a name um, and set us up an appointment and introduced us to Mr. Noel Morgan and Mark and them and they took the case and they've, they've really just been champions in this, uh, yeah, this really plight yeah. to get this all figured out and straightened out. What advice do you have for other people so they don't get caught up in such a mess? Well, I would honestly say that it's very important to do your research. There's a lot of places out there who, who say that they're there to help you. But it, it, in all aspects, it's important to do a lot of research. Legal Aid Society is definitely there to help you. The Home Ownership Center is there definitely to help you. But these private agencies, I would really call the Better Business Bureau. I would call the Attorney General's Office. I would really do a lot of research before I would uh, contract with anybody right. um, to make sure that they were, they're legitimate and how long they've been in um in business and how many families they've really helped, you know, how many with their record, it's really like as far as foreclosure and helping fo families instead of scamming them and taking their money and then they look up and their home is on sheriff sales like like That's ours was ours. Yeah. and then they're being set out and they've lost their home. Because ours was like a week away from the sheriff sales. A week away when we found they out. They was getting ready to come and actually set us out in a That's week. A shock. And been, no, yeah. but before this actual interview, Christopher, you had told me there were a couple of things you wanted to say. And what message did you want to get out there? Well, uh, you know, it's like the American dream is, is for us and for a lot of families. It's not so much to be millionaires or, you know, have a lot of money, but it's to have a home. You know, a home is like a beacon of light. You know, it's where you, where you raise your kids and, and your kids have kids and your grandkids come back there. And there's so many, so many memories and, and things that you share and you make in your home and people should not set up agencies fraudulently to scam people out of their money to leave them in a predicament where they would lose their home. How is that happening in America when right. we really should be trying to look out for one another when you look around and see all the other stuff that's going on in the world? Why would you be, you know, uh, motivated to scam people uh, that they would lose their home like we were. Well, it know? sounds like things are kind of moving in the right direction, yeah. and I'm glad to hear that. So thank you, Dorothy and Christopher. We appreciate your thank time. You thank you so much for just having us and then to speak on this matter. All right, and back to Kathy on the desk. <laughs> now joining us is Stephanie Case Pearson. Stephanie, I want to know a little bit more about Save the Dream program. What is it all about? Sure. So Save the Dream is the state of Ohio's foreclosure prevention effort that Governor Ted Strickland launched in 2008 to help keep as many Ohioans in their homes as possible. So it involves several components. One main component is our Save the Dream hotline, which um, if you don't get a chance to call the phone-a-thon this week, that is a resource for homeowners who are struggling to make their payments. And that number is 888 404 Four six seven four. Um, another part of Save the Dream is our website, which has a wealth of resources for borrowers, including information on the foreclosure process and actions they can take to help themselves stay in their homes. Since the Save the Dream uh, program began, how many individuals is it possible to estimate that you've assisted? Um, more than 15,000 Ohioans have received wow. assistance through Save the Dream. 
That is amazing. What are the what are the top types of assistance? So if you call the foreclosure counseling line, you'll you'll talk to a Save the Dream representative who will ask a series of questions. And then based on your answers, that representative will refer you either to a foreclosure counselor who is a HUD certified counselor and we work with 38 of these counseling agencies including the Cincinnati Home Ownership Center throughout the state so anybody who's calling from anywhere in the state can get help. You're either referred to a housing counselor or if it's determined that you have a legal issue you're referred to pro bono legal assistance and that's a really unique component of Save the Dream um, that Ohio offers. We have more than 1,300 attorneys throughout the state of Ohio who have volunteered to provide pro bono assistance to Ohio's homeowners. Now you work with numerous agencies including Rick's Group and you've got to have some positive stories to pass on there as well as people who've been involved with the Save the Dream program. Absolutely. The, the great thing about the hotline is that uh, a homeowner can hear about it, mm -hmm. make that call, and get a referral to the organization in their geography. And so we receive those referrals from Save the Dream for the homeowners in our region, and then we provide assistance directly to them, and then we save homes from that process. It's a great way to have one number that any Ohioan can understand that they can make that call but actually receive the help from a local partner and that makes a difference in how you receive that assistance because mm -hmm. you know it's often that you make a call and it's someone in another state that happens often with your lender sure you make that you're calling sure. the lender who says call this number and you're calling another state mm -hmm. sometimes another country and it makes a difference to actually have a local partner and that's what Save the Dream offers. You know, I wonder too, when you talk about from the lender's perspective, I mean, they don't want to have to take over all no, these don't. homes. No, they don't. And now I'm not going to sit here and defend every lender's action throughout this process. But the pure economics of the matter, the pure fact of the matter, it's not in the financial interest of a lender to take back property, to foreclose on a family. The cost of foreclosure are not just borne by the borrower, they're also borne by the lender. And one thing that history has shown and continues to show is that when a foreclosure does occur, it not just affects home, that individual home, it affects all the homes around it in that community. Right. Mm -hmm. So considered from this standpoint, assume the lender had this house, the Smith's house, it gets foreclosed upon. And it also has the Jones's house next door or across the block, mm -hmm. but it wasn't foreclosed upon. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now is that the price, the value of that other home, because of that first home, is impacted. So guess what happens? That individual now becomes more likely to have a default. It's just the nature of the process. So lenders have direct interest to not want to foreclose. Now, throughout this process, we have seen many lenders step up and engage in the modification process. We want to see more. Mm -hmm. But we have seen growing numbers. But as I say again, we cannot defend every lender's actions to this point, but we see improvement in those actions. Stephanie, what about when it comes to um, um, renters? If their landlord is in foreclosure, what do they do? Sure. And this is really important. There is help out there for renters. Uh, renters can go to the Save the Dream website, which is www.savethedream.ohio.gov. And there is help for renters. Um, in 2009, Congress passed a new law that is designed to provide more protection for renters. So a renter cannot be evicted from their property unless they have received 90 days notice from their landlord. Um, unless, and if they have a lease on the property, they ha the landlord has to honor that lease so the borrower can stay, or the renter can stay in the home until the lease expires unless a new owner takes over and plans to live in the rental property. And if that happens, again, the, uh, the lender has 90 days before they have to leave the property. Is there also help available, say, if somebody has lost their home? 
Sure, and this is also very important. Recovering from foreclosure can be a very difficult experience for many former homeowners. Um, we, the state of Ohio, has the Ohio Benefit Bank, which can screen individuals who call in for work support such as child care, health care, food stamps, and things of that nature. And that can help them, that can help ease the burden and help them better manage their finances. Also, if somebody has 211 in their area, they can call 211 to find out about more local resources. And there is a website, which is www.ohiohousinglocator.org, and that can help Ohioans find safe and affordable rental properties that fit their needs and their budget throughout the state of Ohio. You know, we've talked a lot about what uh, people who are falling behind in their mortgage payments should do. What are some of the things they shouldn't do? Well, they should not ignore the problem. Ignoring the problem will not make it go away, and it can make it worse. Um, they should... Um, uh, they should not accept help for a fee. They should definitely not pay anybody for mortgage assistance because they can call Save the Dream or they can call the Phonathon or they can call a HUD certified housing counseling agency and they can get the help they need for free. And they should definitely not make payments to somebody other than their mortgage servicer, which is a common scam um, from that, that homeowners uh, hear about as they're struggling with their mortgage loans. Um, they should also not stop making payments to their servicer if they can avoid it. Yeah, we talked about all the stuff that comes in the mail when you because all that stuff is getting to be public record anymore and unfortunately there's a lot of people who prey on these individuals that offer them well I'm gonna come to your rescue and help you out of this and I know in some cases they actually end up owning your home yes. and you have nothing That's right? True. That's true. It's it's um, it's unfortunate that uh, that a foreclosure filing is a public action, mm -hmm. and because of that, and there's always predators out there, and there are many predators I'll say who were predatory lenders, and they changed the shingle, and now they're predatory foreclosure prevention specialists. It's it's unfortunate, but that's what they do. Have you, have you, are you both getting a lot of calls along those lines of people who are yes. Yes. not only facing the difficulties of trying to figure out what to do about the foreclosure situation, now they find sure. out that, oh, and it's hard to admit, there's another one that's really hard exactly. to admit. It is very difficult, and, and, and it's very sad when we have families who come to us and uh, the scam that they are a victim of is they paid someone a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for them to tell the family about us. And that's all that they did. And that's why we work very hard to get the information out that we exist. Because people are actually paying someone just to learn that the service that they need is free to them. And I know that the Attorney General's office is a part of the Save the yes, Dream initiative right. to sort of combat that sort of thing. The Attorney General has been an active partner in trying to go after as many foreclosure rescue scammers as we can. Right. Um, so and successfully. Yes. Yes. Lately, I've been hearing about some. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you got to be heartened at how many people, like you were mentioning, that have been turning to save the dream. Maybe the word's finally getting out there, and they're thinking, okay, there, are, there is help available. I can make these phone calls, and I don't have to lose my American dream. You know, there's so much clutter, though, and it's not just about foreclosure prevention. It's everywhere. The communications are so easy anymore, and there's so much clutter out there. And, and, and in the midst of all of this phone-a-thon and phone calls, and uh, we leave here, I turn on the television, and you see one of these scams of having to pay money, and they say, just make the call. And I'm saying, <laughs> we say that. You can't say that. We say that. So there's just a lot of clutter out there. And so it's just important to understand where it's safe to get help and where it's not safe to get help. All right. Now let's go back over to Ann Thompson, who is joined by Lakeisha Roseman from the Home Ownership Center of Greater Cincinnati. They're going to update us on what documents you need to take with you when working with a lender. Ann? So, Lakeisha, you can't just show up to your lender empty-handed. There are a number of forms that you need, correct? Yes, absolutely. There are a number of forms that really help the lender to see your financial picture. All right. And I understand that we have uh, some... Uh, video of them and why don't we first talk about the hardship statement that we're going to be seeing. 
Right. It is very common for each lender to ask for a homeowner to provide a hardship statement, basically outlining exactly what it is that's been going on with that homeowner that has either caused them to fall behind or they think that it's going to cause eminent delinquency. Another form that we want to talk about is the mortgage statement. Right, and the mortgage statement just easily allows the lender to identify who this homeowner is, especially if they have more than one account at that bank, and it lets them know um, that which account you are specifically asking for assistance with. All right, and as we continue on, proof of income, and there is a number of different elements to that, correct? Right. So proof of income can mean a lot of different things depending on the homeowner. So proof of income can include a check sub, or and they usually want to see at least a month's worth of income. It can also include um, a retirement statement, and those retirement statements can be Social Security statement or if they're receiving retirement funds from their um, employer from which they retire. And it can also be their W-2s from the last year. And as we continue on with the list that people should bring to their lender, another one is the proof of insurance. Right. The proof of insurance is extremely important because many times when a homeowner falls behind, the lender wants to make sure that there is still insurance on the house. And if not, they will place insurance on that house. So you want to make sure that you show your proof of insurance so that you're not getting a higher insurance placed on your house because they think that you don't have it bank statement. Right. They want the bank statements and usually they're going to ask for about two months. So um, it's just important to start to gather those things for the lender to see. And how hard is it to gather all this stuff? Is it pretty time consuming? Well, you know, it all depends on the homeowner and if they they have adequate files or not. But all of those things are things that you can call to request from either your bank or your employer or whoever holds those statements. They're common things requested for many services that you, um, when you're asking for assistance from anywhere. So they're pretty quick to get. You just have to be on the ball and start to get them early if you're planning on submitting. The biggest thing is to have them all at once. A lot of times lenders um, will put your file on hold because they don't have your full financial picture and they can't make an adequate decision or a correct decision if they don't have it all together. And that would be so frustrating to show up and here you have the time with the lender and then you're missing a form. Absolutely. That is going to be the most, most um, frustrating thing that they're going to go up against. So we're just encouraging people to start to pull that stuff together now because this is an opportunity that doesn't come across many times to have the lenders fly into town and meet you face to face, to not have to fax, to not have to sit on the phone and wait on hold because there's so many homeowners in the same situation. But to actually have a face to face appointment where you're going to be able to discuss the situation with a decision maker. Yeah. And how big a problem is that that people might just have partial documents? We think that it's very common. Many times we struggle with some of the clients that we have to really pull those documents together in a timely fashion. But um, we're trying to get the word out to let people know exactly what the banks are looking for, the most common documents that each lender is going to request so that they can start to pull it together now. And as people call into this phone I'm wondering, is that something that they're being told or is that later in the process? Oh, no. Well, first we actually tell them on these calls, to, we refer them to our website, which is the www.buzzusnow.com, to look for the list because we've posted it. And the second thing they'll get is a mailer in about a week and a half, and that also gives them the list of things that they want to bring. So we try to reinforce it as much as we can. Now, the different places that they're going to be getting these documents then, uh, are the people willing to help out uh, the person facing foreclosure? Are they, is it going to take a long time to get these forms? No, it's not. Um, usually, you know, to get a copy of your bank statement or to get, usually if you go in your bank, go to your bank, you can get something printed. It's pretty simple. Your employer, that, it, it kind of depends on your employer how quickly you can get it, but many of the, many of the employers now have it online where you can just um, pull it up. And, of course, homeowners are welcome to call us for us to try to assist them in any way that we can to help them gather it and take them along this path. Well, thank you, Lakeisha. You've given us some really important information, and um, just I guess people have to know that they need to have all their kind of ducks in a row uh, in order to uh, have the documents for the lenders. Right. We're just looking for the most positive resolution possible. All right. Well, thank you, and we'll go back to Kathy at the desk. Foreclosures have been a very difficult topic that's been going on for some time now. Doctor, maybe I'm thinking, is there a light at the end of this tunnel? I can say with all verdant honesty, yes, 
there is a light at the end of this tunnel. And I can also say, with as much credibility, we don't know exactly how far away that light is. Because you know light travels an infinite distance, right? <laughs> but I can but. tell you this, we're making good time toward that light. Now, before we talk about how far away the end of that tunnel is, let's review how we got here quickly. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a little bit of education about where we need to go. Because mm -hmm. we can still craft how we come out of this tunnel. Two, three years ago, we're talking subprime mortgages. We're talking Alt-A lending. We're talking about bad debt management practices. Mm -hmm. There was, as we said before, a method to address those issues. But now, overlayered on top of that, we have this growing, still growing problem of unemployment. Unfortunately, a stronger problem here, a deeper problem here in Ohio than many other areas of the nation. What keeps us from reaching the end of that tunnel quickly is that unemploy unemployment is a lagging indicator. We can be in a period of recovery, which we are by most economist standards, by the chairman uh, Ben Bernanke of the Fed's statement recently that we're technically at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But what keeps us from returning to where we were is that now we have slack in the economy. We have that high unemployment. We have that young lady. We have that gentleman sitting at home watching TV without a place to go to work. That's lost production. And what that means is, even if they're not a homeowner, what that means is when they could have brought demand to the market to buy one of these foreclosed homes, they can't now. That keeps prices low. And there's so many of these individuals out there that it keeps prices lower for a long period to come. And what I speak to here really is this, is that the exit point on that tunnel will look nothing like the entry point to how we got to the tunnel. Look into that crystal ball, what do you see? What I see is this, we will likely have high levels of unemployment in this country for at least one to two more years. We will have low rates of home price appreciation for at least one more year, two more years, because we still have slack demand in the economy. But that's not to be saying we are up against a wall and we will fall. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the rational consumer, the rational homeowner, the rational person who is working themselves out of this foreclosure situation can use this knowledge, use this revised environment to adjust how they will adjust in the future. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means save more. Okay? Save more. Be more rational in how you manage debt. You don't hawk a home to buy a TV. Okay? Work hard. The biggest asset the average American has, other than their health, you know what that is? Their job. And we've seen how that asset can go away. Thirdly, keep faith that you will pass through this and we will. America, we've had it hard before, but we always come out. And one of the worst things that people can do is lose faith that they will get to the end of that tunnel. We will get to the end of that tunnel, but make sure when we get there, we act differently mm -hmm. than when we entered the tunnel. And that's my humble opinion on this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> When we talk about foreclosure, you know, somebody seeing the program says, well, you know, it's not my problem. I'm not going through this right now. But let's face it, it's a problem that all of us are being hit by, right, Steph? Yes. That's right. That's right. Every foreclosure in a neighborhood can lower surrounding property values by up to 1%. Every additional foreclosure also lowers the surrounding property values, and they can cut into a tax base. Vacant properties attract crime and uh, they can become eyesores because they're not well maintained and the lawns become overgrown, uh, squatters can move in. So it's a real problem for the community and it can make surrounding neighbors uh, have a more difficult time selling their homes. So when we get out of this situation, we're gonna see properties that weren't quite, are not as valued as much as they were going in? Interesting use of language there, okay? 
not valued as much or not priced as much. Okay, right. that's the big that's difference. It. Before, people would pay a price because they thought that's what it was worth. Not necessarily. We've proven that when we've given up. 20, 30, in California, 60% of home values, okay? Mm -hmm. Price is not value. Mm -hmm. One needs to go in and pay a price commensurate, equal to the value they have on that home. Just because you can see a home that might be worth 100 to, I mean, be priced at 100, 150, 200,000, you have to consider this, three things. Is it accessible? And what I mean there is this. But do I understand contract language, the mortgage? I'm signing something that says I'm going to pay you for 30 years. So is that mortgage accessible to me? Second, is it affordable? Don't focus on the price of the home just. Focus also on the affordability of that mortgage. If that mortgage changes, can I pay it? How stable is my job? Third, Focus on sustainability. No one wants to put someone on the street. That's not sustainable. That costs everyone. So you want to go into a home purchase situation thinking about sustainability. Can I ride this out in the good times as well as the bad times? That's a very different mindset than what we had as recently as two years ago. But if we want to get to the next 20, 30 years, you've got to change that mindset to be driven by sustainability, affordability, and accessibility. And it's difficult. It's a difficult mindset to change to because there's always pressures to keep drawing you back and buy more house and exactly. spend more money. It's and been this generation. Exactly. Exactly. Have it now. Don't wait. Instant All of those pressures are always, are, will always be there. And so you have to have the mindset and fight against the environment that encourages you to do something else. And that is going to be very different at the end exactly. of the tunnel as well. At the end of the tunnel, what would you prefer to say? I have the biggest home in the block or I own a home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Think about that. Exactly. Are you seeing evidence that people are starting to change their minds and wrapping around a little bit different concept than perhaps we were when we started doing these programs? Uh, actually, no. no. I wish I okay. could. Uh, well. You know what I see? I see people surprised that the environment has changed that forces them to have to do that. But, but they have to move there because the, the yes you can mortgage presentations aren't there any longer. So it's not as easy to get that mortgage as it used to be, mm -hmm. thankfully. And so, now you have to have more personal dollars in the investment of that property. There's a whole lot of things. The uh, credit score formulas have changed, and what used to be a 620 is now a 580. And so all of those things are just new realities. And uh, it's different for the classes that we have where we're training new home buyers to be successful. Mm -hmm. Our presentation is dramatically different. It is not the same presentation about the availability of mortgages. We always had trouble trying to keep a family from spending the money that the lender says they can afford. We've always had that trouble. But now, now we don't because the lender's affordability level is about the same as ours. <laughs> See, now, now, we'll say, Kathy, on the broader aggregate, we're already seeing a little bit of, I know we like to use the words green shoots when we talk about economics, but we're actually starting to see a little bit of green shoots in terms of modification of people's mindsets, how they're doing things, okay? We're actually seeing a positive savings rate in this country That's again, true. okay? I know that sounds ridiculous. You would think, well, it's always been positive. We actually were running, mathematically, a negative savings rate in this country. Yeah, right. But because of the situation we're in, we're seeing personal savings rise. The question becomes, is it sustainable? And who's saving? And who's saving? Yes. Yes. Now let's check back in with Ann Thompson. She's now joined by Carla Leader, an attorney from the Legal Aid Society, to discuss foreclosure scams and how to avoid becoming a victim. Ann? You know, Carla, these foreclosure scams are still very much in the news. Even today, a bunch of people were arrested, including people in Ohio, for preying on people in these situations. What kind of tactics do 
people involved in these scams use on people? Well, you know, these scams, like most most scam artists, they're playing on, preying on desperate people. And homeowners who are behind on their mortgage, who are facing foreclosure, are in a desperate situation. And they're looking for help anywhere they can get it. Unfortunately, they turn to their lenders, where hoping that they're going to be able to get some kind of assistance, especially with all this federal money that has been thrown at the banks. And they're not getting a lot of help from their lenders. Here these scam artists come along and offer to help them. They guarantee that they're going to save their home. They tell them that they have professionals that are very experienced in dealing with lenders. They tell them that they have ins with the banks and the lenders, that they know people, and that they're able to get you know, workout deals that they wouldn't be able to get on their own. Um, they charge them money. They tell them, you know, for $1,000, we're going to save your home. Um, unfortunately, what, what generally ends up happening is the homeowner hands over the $1,000, which is not easy for them to come by or they wouldn't be in the situation they're in. And then they're out of that money and nobody's helping them. And to make matters even worse, these scam artists are telling these homeowners that part of the deal is that they do not speak with their lenders on their own. So here they're handing over the money, thinking somebody's helping them, and then two, three, four months later they find out that their house has been scheduled for sheriff sale. So it's, it's a really horrible situation and these scam artists have really, you know, they're preying on these homeowners and there's so many right now, so they've really hit on a very vulnerable population. In working for the Legal Aid Society, you probably see lots of these situations. Are there any that stick out in your mind? Well, you know, the Gilliams were on your show earlier, and they certainly are a perfect example. Even today uh, at the Phonathon, we've had several calls that the legal aid attorneys have taken where they have been t talked to people who have already been victims of these scams, thinking that somebody's helping them. Um, the Legal Aid Society has also been working very closely with the Ohio Attorney General's Office in going after some of these rescue scams, and we're pleased to say that we have had some success in shutting some of these operations down. And was that a difficult process? Well, like any lawsuit, um, you know, it is a difficult process, but if the clients come to us and they have been victimized, we are, you know, really wanting to go after these places and shut them down so that they can't victimize more people. You know, it, there are so many people in crisis right now, and we really want to get them help. And, you know, when if, if an operation or a letter comes to them saying, we guarantee to save your home, we will be able to get you a workout, call us, and we can do what no one else can do, that's a red flag. You know, anytime somebody in this situation is asking you for money and you know clearly money that you don't have it, it's a red flag and there's free help out there um, the homeowners can call 411 for assistance there is help and they should not be paying money anytime somebody is asking for money it's a red flag do not pay anyone money <laughs> You know, you referenced the Gilliams who were on the show earlier. Mm -hmm. Their story just seems so unbelievable that they had to prove um, that she was still alive. And mm -hmm. it just, but I'm sure there are other situations like this. Yeah, there are so many situations where that that you know the people who aren't facing this type of thing would find just absolutely unbelievable. And you can imagine these homeowners facing this alone. It's very scary. And, you know, again, this is why these rescue scams are so successful, because these people are very desperate. They don't want to lose their homes. And they are victims of the economy at this point with, you know, unemployment. And, you know, they're not making the same kind of money they were. They're having trouble with their mortgage payments. They should work with their housing counselors. They should not be falling victim to these, for these scams. It's really not going to get them anywhere. Yeah, and as you mentioned, they're just looking at any possible solution mm -hmm. given the situation of I've got to save my house. But right. again, what are some guidelines? You mentioned um, some of them earlier. Yes. The guidelines as far as so the, the right thing to do? Yes, why don't we yeah. take it that? Well, I mean, first of all, like I said, the, you know, the, well, actually, I didn't say, the foreclosure, once a foreclosure is filed, it's public record. So once a foreclosure is filed, these homeowners are going to be bombarded with mailings and phone calls from these types of operations saying, we can help you, we can save your homes. They need to call a legitimate counseling agency like the Homeownership Center, who is part of this operation today. and contact legal aid for assistance if if legal aid is unable to assist because of our some of our guidelines we can certainly refer them to other sources of, of assistance um, they should just not be paying any of their hard-earned money that they're already having trouble you know 
putting out to the right places. They should not be paying this to these people that are not are just going to keep it and move on. Some good advice, Carla. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Let's go back to Kathy yeah. at the desk. Let's talk now a little bit about next steps that we need to take. Let's talk first about home closure prevention counseling. Yes, I think it's important for people to understand that counseling, you know, counseling has that word of just sort of nurturing, consoling, and it's there's a lot of technical assistance attached to foreclosure prevention counseling of just debt to income analysis and expenses and what is uh, secured debt and what is unsecured debt and what payment should you make and what should you not make when you're in a crisis budget mode. And there's a lot of things that a foreclosure prevention counselor provides that people cannot understand is a part of this process. And, you know, for a counselor, the greatest tool is a calculator. Most people think it's a hug. <laughs> it's not. It's a calculator. There's a lot of work of understanding what you should be doing, uh, talking to that lender and loan servicer about what the options are, understanding when that loan servicer gives you an option, helping the homeowner understand what that means such that they can sustain that situation, as uh, Dr. Henry talks about. So uh, don't miss out on what all of the benefits of a HUD certified counselor. Those are the only ones that Save the Dream uses mm -hmm. and we do that work for free. Don't miss out on that. Next steps for we as a community. Well, if you believe in the statement that you're your brother's keeper, then that means you're your brother's keeper. No if and ands or buts. And what I mean is this. You may not be at risk of losing your home, but your neighbor may be. He's in your community. She's in your community. Reach out and help those in your community in ways that you can. This, you may be watching this show and not be at risk, but you know someone who may be. Give them the phone number. Tell them what we're doing. Get other people involved. The most important thing to do to prevent foreclosure is to engage others. Yes. And that just doesn't have to happen from the individual being affected, but the people around that individual who see that individual being affected. So we as a community have to have that big kumbaya moment and say, I too can help because I am my brother's keeper. Next step when it comes to somebody who's facing possible foreclosure. So the minute that somebody begins to struggle to afford their mortgage, they should pick up the phone and call Save the Dream. Um, or they should call the phone-a-thon if they, if they are looking for help this week. But definitely make that call. Help is free and we have pro bono attorneys and HUD certified counselors that are waiting to help you. I like what you said early, afford what you have. Yes, spend less than what you make get used to spending less than what you make and that is good for all of us not those of us who are just facing foreclosure that's good for all of us it's good for the community mm -hmm. spend less than what you bring home and, and also money. it's good for the general economy yes one fundamentally when you're saying spend less than what you make identically you're saying save yes. and you know what happens when a lot of people save in the long run prices are lower investments higher, yes. general wealth in the economy grows, everyone's made better off. So another way to look at it is how to help your community save more as an individual. You will not only benefit, but your children will benefit also. Yes. And that's what you got to consider. That's why you're buying a house. Rick, when you see people that are coming in for foreclosure assistance, let's talk just ballpark figures, foreclosures. Helping. How many people do you think you can estimate that can actually help out and help them either stay in their home or walk away with their head held high? Um, we have helped homeowners who the, the, the sale date is pending and it's already scheduled and it's within the following week. And we've been able to get with that loan servicer, get that sale delayed, and then start that process. Don't think that because you have that pending sale date that it's too late. The only time it's really too late 
is when the sale is completed, and that even means when the court system has made the sale date official. So there's even some time between the actual moment that the sheriff sale occurs and the court system verifies that that you could actually keep that from happening. So don't get discouraged that it's too late. Because the lenders really don't want your house. Yes, you got it. They don't want your house. <laughs> it hurts their profits. Yes. <laughs> and and if you feel that that you know it, there's too much paperwork here and I've let it go too long, don't. it may not be too late. It may not be too late. Call, get some assistance as quickly as possible. And we understand that when we uh, uh, analyze the results of this phone phoneathon, we look at those who are at imminent risk, the ones who have sale sale dates, and we work with those immediately. As opposed to the ones that aren't even delinquent yet, but they believe that because of a job loss or some catastrophe, that this will be a problem. We get on those with the sale dates already scheduled. How soon from the time that they make phone calls can they generally hope to hear from somebody? Great question. See all those computers over there? Yep. It is why we have them because we've automated everything. So all of that would be a lot quicker instead of doing it manually. Great. Hopefully, we're going to save the dream, keep it going for many years to come. Thank you so much for being with us. We really Thank appreciate you. a lot of Thank wonderful you. information. And hopefully the next time we do this, we're going to have a lot less to talk about, right? That would be great. That would be great. Definitely that would, would be. be. Thank you all very much. For those viewers who have not yet called in with their questions, you may continue to call even after today's bonathon. To reach a home ownership specialist, call 1-877-7-BUZZ-US. They are available to talk with you Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. You may also visit their website at buzzusnow.com for more information. To find out more about foreclosure prevention and other community resources that are willing to help you, please visit our special website at cincymortgagecrisis.org. You may also call 721-7900 or simply call the United Way at 211 and ask for mortgage help. If you would like to watch this special report again, on demand, visit our website at cetconnect.org. Thanks for watching. I'm Kathy Lair along with Ann Thompson. Have a great evening. use or rebroadcast of this copyrighted program or portions thereof is prohibited without the express written approval of CET.